Cool. Do you want me to do a quick intro, if you want, and then I'll take the question. Uh, I will, yes. Uh, Mark Coyle, I am the Head of Digital Production for BT Sport. Uh, I spent 18, that's right, 18 years in the BBC until the end of September. The last two and a half years were spent working on the Olympics, where I was editor of BBC London 2012 online. Um, I said uh, the other day to somebody in BT that uh, that time had been a highlight of my professional career and suddenly realised what I was saying and then quickly added, apart from coming to work for BT Sport of course. <laughs> Um, but it was, of course, a, a special time in the careers and the lives of everybody who worked in the Olympics in London. And um, I think well, probably it was the uh, motivating factor behind my joining BT Sport. Um, and we broke ground there that um, hopefully we'll carry some of that over into what you see in BT Sport. And I'm uh, very proud to have been associated with the stuff that the BBC did at the time. So that's the BBC I've worked over for the evening. And, uh, to, um, Cool, that sounds better to me. Um, what I'll do is actually, I'm going to tinker with the settings over here. Make up a bit on the top. Okay. Um, I just want to ask a quick question to Mark first, before we move over. And this question is actually, in terms of BT Sport, how are you actually looking to balance kind of the large or online audience with keeping some of it premium and paid for and exclusive? So how are you going to manage that kind of relationship? I think we've got a particular challenge, especially because we are a new brand, where uh, BT is not new to sport, but it's certainly new to being a sports production company and a sports broadcaster. So I, I think what we have to do, first of all, is recognize that we have to give as much access as possible to what we're doing uh, on the live channels out there. But of course, we have to bear in mind that we're pursuing a commercial model that you, I hope, will have seen uh, the marketing message that we were, that was at the forefront of our launch on May, May the 9th, and if you haven't seen it, then we've failed somewhere down the line, but um, I don't think you can travel down the length of many streets in Britain at the moment without seeing some of our advertising, and the centre of that is that the content is free. Now, you can have a hypothetical theoretical debate around the notion of it being free, but it's free with BT broadband. Um, what we will certainly be doing at launch is uh, providing access to some of our content that will, over time, um, be premium. But, but the point being here, we, we have to get people, we have to expose ourselves to the market in order to give people the choice as to whether or not they want to subscribe to it. It's not the only way that we'll, we'll open up BT Sport to people. There are lots of plans that we have around using social media um, to take people up to a glass door, if you like, and let them press their noses against the door and then give them as much sight and visibility of what we're doing as possible. And then the choice is theirs after that. So you can tell I'm being cautious around that. Um, but I'm just trying to describe a situation where we want to be as open and accessible as possible but of course we have to ultimately seek the subscriptions at the end of the day. So you're right, it's a, it's a balancing act and, and hopefully we'll get that right. It may change a bit over time though. I'm sure there'll be questions on that coming up in the morning as we go along. Right, so move across to Dennis. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Dennis Crushell. I work um, specifically on YouTube Sports. I've worked in Google for the last five years um, with advertisers mainly in retail and sports. And about eight months ago, I moved over to YouTube specifically, focusing on sports. Um, so I work for in uh, Northern and Central Europe, uh, working with advertisers and trying to find uh, their audience, but as well targeting relevant content on YouTube and sports specifically. Um, so that's that's um, and, and dealing specifically with the YouTube partnership team who deals with our top partners in sports. So I'm sure some of you here actually work with that team directly. And Richard, who you met earlier, obviously would be a uh, partner of ours as well with COVID 90, working directly with that team. Cool. And then I thought I'd dive kind of both feet in with uh, the first question. And um, I'm sure many people out there have been wondering in terms of like right, the last couple of weeks subscription paid for model was introduced finally which is quite long anticipated. I mean how do you think that's going to affect or encourage or put off kind of sports rights holders and consumers of sport? 
Um, so I think, first of all, in terms of uh, paid subscriptions being introduced, um, there are micro payments per month uh, to access content on YouTube. Uh, we've just tested that with 30 partners. Um, these are mostly US-based partners, or they're all US-based partners, um, where they have been on the platform. A lot of them are rights holders, UFC, uh, wrestling as well, for instance, in the US. And I think initially we're going to look at it as testing and looking at people who are already rights holders on the platform and then looking at opening it up to others. I think it's a great opportunity for rights holders who haven't um, who haven't distributed their content on YouTube to date, an opportunity to actually have a revenue source, uh, whether it be a new revenue source, uh, they're already on YouTube, or someone who haven't been on YouTube in the past, to share that content on YouTube. Um, the one thing is as well, not necessarily that it is uh, live content or highlight content, but um, the UFC is a good example in the States who have very much been at the forefront of digital and have a very much younger demographic as a result. But where they have, they're now producing for their paid subscribed uh, UFC Select channel content that's more around the players and the personalities of the players, but high quality production content. So it will give an opportunity for people who haven't been able to come to YouTube to date because the the revenue source might be there, a new revenue source where you might be able to invest in the platform uh, to come onto YouTube. Thank you, Dennis. Right, pass on to Tom. Um, uh, so uh, I've been at the RFU for about the last four years, um, heading up all the digital content for them. Um, so that's content strategy and uh, social media strategy as well. Um, in that four years, it's uh, the place has gone through a bit of a, well, a very big transition digitally, um, from a point where the website was where stuff got bunged to a point where digital is now being written into uh, partner contracts and sport, uh, sponsor contracts and sort of. Uh, ring fenced amounts that have to be spent on digital activation of videos. Um, a big part of that has been introducing video. Um, we've uh, got a fairly substantial YouTube presence now um, and we launched a, uh, a native video platform um, probably about nine months ago, I think. Um, and video really sort of touches pretty much everything that we do content wise in some way. You managed to almost answer my question already, but um, in terms of what's kind of your biggest success has been in that time, what would kind of you put your finger on in the, the top? Um, I think a big, a big part of how we've been using video recently is uh, is to help activate those partner uh, as partner deals and, and activate sponsorships. So, O2 Inside Line has been massive for us, which is a, uh, a weekly magazine show that goes out during the Six Nations and during the Autumn Internationals when England are playing. And it's kind of the flagship behind the scenes piece. Um, it's it's fairly high budget. It's it's really nice production values. Um, has a lot of seeding cash behind it as well. Um, I think on top of that, probably just just our presence in YouTube, on, on YouTube has been huge. It's it's let us reach out to new audiences and, and far more casual blogging fans than would normally come and find us on RFU.com. Uh, and the feedback, is, the, the sort of the feedback loop for us is, is very good as well. So um, I use the retention analytics a lot, so that we can discover what people want to be, what, what people want to hear about and who they want to hear from, um, and that feeds into all of our news content during the video videos. Cool. Okay, let's jump into a bit more general questions. Um, um, probably the most general I could possibly ask in terms of what role do you think of online media or video can actually play within sports? Do you reckon that could be any more general? It's huge. It's, it's, a, it's a really, really effective fan engagement tool. Um, it's what we've found. And for, for, for clubs and for governing bodies, it lets you um, take the audience behind the scenes, but uh, in quite a controlled way. Um, so the comms department love it, because they can get a message direct from the squad and from the team to the, to the audience. Um, I think there's a there's a huge role for it to play in uh, uh, for minority sports in terms of kind of streaming um, live sport because at the end of the day all of the VOD stuff and all of the uh, the fan engagement stuff is nothing if people can't actually watch your sport. So uh, for people to now have the capability to do that on fairly low budgets, I think is uh, is massive. Um, what I'd say would be that. It's, it's another form of distribution, just how you distribute any content. Um, in terms of 
even the example earlier today uh, from Rich from COVID-19 where he looked at their audience, a much younger demographic audience, particularly for that football channel, where it was 46% of their views now are on mobile devices. If you think of digital media and looking at mobile being a, the next device uh, being digital media, I think everything's just going to be screened and it's device agnostic in the future, whether it be a TV, whether it be a desktop, whether it be a mobile, whether it be a tablet, it's just another form of distribution. And I think that opens up great opportunities for sports in terms of interactive. Um, Rich earlier as well talked about interactive. Um, you might have seen in the rugby league in Australia, they look at ref cams and looking at those angles right now. In the Heineken Cup actually recently as well, the Sky Sports has shown some ref cam angle. And it really just brings a, a two-way dimensional opportunity and interactive uh, between the user and the distributor or the right holder. Um, and I think, uh, what was the last thing? Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Um, what they said. But I think, I think what I'd add to that is that um, it's about storytelling. And sport is no different from many other genres um, in that it's about storytelling by whatever means you're telling it. But sport is obviously particularly inclined, well, well suited to that storytelling because you can engage with the stories of the sportsmen and women that you're watching and they may be your heroes. Um, but it's more than that as well. It's not always about the elites. And I think one of the things that we want to do is to give some insight into people who are uh, not involved in sport at the top level or who have particularly powerful stories to tell. And I know that you wouldn't mind me saying this, but um, I've met recently twice uh, Martine Wright, who some of not most of you will know. And she obviously has a particularly powerful story in that she lost her legs in the 77 bombings and then she's quite literally fought her way into representing Great Britain. And Martine's very keen to work with us not to tell her story. I want to tell her story but I also want to give some insight into what drives her and what motivates her. And she's a good example of how by giving her the camera, by asking her to make it part of what she does on a daily basis, we can tell a story about it powerfully. And, and I'm looking forward to seeing her contributions as part of the Beta Sports. Yes, I mean, we've spoken a lot about the opportunities that we are, but I'm sure kind of anyone who's trying to champion social media and digital has hit a few walls on the way as well, in terms of, you know, I mean, what do you think is about the biggest dangers and threats that there are? Because, you know, people say, oh, you know, we can't put our content up because X, Y, and Z. Do you think there's any threats that are out there that people need to be aware of in terms of promoting their content? Um, not massively, no, I don't think. I think there's um, there's always the opportunity for your cock-ups to, to be seen by a lot of people very, very quickly, um, but the answer there is just don't make cock-ups. Um, we work very, very closely with our comms team. Um, they don't have sign-off of what we're putting out there, but we know the sensitive issues and, and we, know that we know what to keep going out for before we put the content out there. Um, and, you know, even if, even if you do cock up, it, it, you, can, you can sort of redeem yourself in how you, uh, in how you manage that situation. You know, O2 are famous for having a fantastic Twitter service because they respond very well when they get complaints. People seem to forget the fact that they get shitloads of complaints because they cock up. <laughs> I mean, you tell us, I mean, in terms of if you've got, um, if you're working with people who are trying to fight, you know, that fight within their organisation, I mean, what advice do you have for them? Um, I think, like, with digital, you think it's the hide, it's harder to hide them online where you have that two-way conversation directly with the people that your brand is interacting with, or whether it be your broadcaster or whatever it is. Um, I think. The, the threat, the biggest threat I think is, is missing out on eyeballs and audiences or interacting with that audience who want to interact with you. Um, as the RFU, we're saying that it's perhaps lighter rugby viewers instead of the hardcore rugby viewers who are watching all their content on YouTube. You might miss out on actually getting that audience as a result. I think um, someone like the NBA is a good example on YouTube specifically. They have 3.2 billion subscribers, 3.2 million subscribers, um, over 1.4 billion views on YouTube. When they first started to upload content on YouTube, they weren't doing it perfectly. They were just uploading uh, clips. 
and actually the major uh, the baseball league uploads a lot of clips now. You can see they're at an early stage of doing this, but it's all testing. It's testing what your audience actually likes, putting it out there, and then trying to get a bigger audience uh, for your sport in particular online on YouTube. Um, so I think one of the biggest threats is missing out on a generation, particularly the younger generation, and then another sport could actually take your followership or club or whatever it is. Um, a, a last example with the club piece actually is interesting to see on YouTube is uh, Manchester City do a great job of actually producing unique content for a YouTube channel. And you can see in the comments sometimes that people who follow other clubs are saying you're so lucky to actually have this content. A lot of Man United uh, fans and so on and so forth. So it's interesting. I think the biggest threat is not to test and not to start opening yourselves up because it's only going to get more and more in the future. As I said er earlier, I think it's going to be device agnostic, but as well, once the generations get older and older, it's just going to be the norm of what the younger generation are doing right now. I think, um, well, in terms of the broadcast point of view, um, you know, you bought, spent a lot of money on these rights, and obviously the whole evolution of digital could be seen as a threat as well. I mean, how do you see that in terms of, you know, how do you make it work as a broadcaster, and what do you see as kind of threats to the traditional kind of rights model, really? Um, I think, I think that was actually. I'm not going to go on like saying what they said, but you know, I'm not sure that there are rights. If if open and honest conversations are had when you're negotiating to secure rights, and so long as you can you can satisfy the person or people from whom you're looking to acquire the rights that you will treat their sport with respect and that you you will deal with it appropriately uh, when you're distributing the content on whatever platform. And I don't think there are any threats as such. I mean, I, I have been more uh, fortunate to be to be closer to the actual uh, negotiation of rights deals, and I'm not, not right at the sharp end of it, but um, than I've ever been in, in recent months. And you know, they are fascinating conversations to be part of and to understand that when you do acquire rights, it's almost like um, I know it sounds a bit cheesy, but it's almost like I'm told from the other side, it's like wel welcoming a new member of the family, and. Um, this may be my first and last mention of MotoGP tonight. Probably not, actually. Uh, MotoGP is my sport. Uh, love sport, but MotoGP is my sport. <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking around here because people who know me are probably burning daggers at me just now for being mentioning that. Um, but I was over at the French MotoGP at the weekend and I met lots of people behind the scenes and was looking at production facilities. And that's exactly how it felt like, we, like BT Sport was being welcomed into the Dorna and the MotoGP family. And, and I think that is, is, is the case. You're, you are being entrusted with, with, with the, the, the family prize, if you like, and, and you have to treat it with respect. You, you pledge to, to help the sport grow you, on whatever platform you're putting it out on. And I think it would be remiss of uh, any uh, rights holder now not to use social media and, of course, digital media to, to reach as far and wide an audience as possible. Going on slightly, in terms of, I mean, from where YouTube has come from, kind of user generated things, I suppose the kind of generic question would be does the production value still matter? Because obviously we've got YouTube with the amount of content that's been uploaded, Twitter release to Vine as well, so again it's coming from the phone. But yeah, should it all be high value that it's kind of, that, you know, we want to come from the Sports Federation or should it be a mix of, you know, some iPhone, some um, high production value? You know, yeah, I, it's, it's an area I, I uh, feel particularly strongly about. Um, I'm well aware of the appeal of the iPhone or smartphone style content. I mean, we see it so often that it's that snatch of five or ten seconds that, that, that sets everything it needs to, and you don't need a production effort behind it. But I'm absolutely convinced that there will always be a place for high-end production values. Things that people take time and, and spend money and, and put resource into, into crafting. And I don't see anything that, that, that tells me that that is going to go away anytime soon. Online video consumption, you know, again, everybody in this room will know that, that the shorter, easily snackable clips will, in all likelihood, do better. It's not always about the numbers, it's about the impact that is created by it. Um, but one thing that, that we're trying to do is uh, 
is give the RFE TV content a visual identity as well. Um, so that over time we kind of build a bit of authority and there are visual cues all the time that you're watching RFE TV content and at best it's beautiful and at, and at worst it's interesting. Um, having said that, I think there are, there are times when uh, the content can meet the production values. So, um, yeah, the Ian Holloway dancing in the, in the changing rooms over the weekend wouldn't have worked as a polished piece of produced content. Um, so I think that it's striking that balance and it's being aware of when you when you put the production values on and you don't need to, to, to tell the story in the right way. I mean, would you make a difference between the content that goes on IFU TV and the website to what goes on YouTube, for example? Uh, yeah, because the audience is different. Um, as I mentioned, we, we can reach a, a much more casual rugby audience and, and a much more casual sports audience and uh, essentially a YouTube audience on YouTube. Um, whereas RFE.com is a place where people come to get the content because they know they already want it. Um, so we can we can get away with doing a bit more than that from there. We see um, much higher percentage views in terms of dwell times on the videos on, on RFE TV. Um, and just, as Dennis said, by, by experimenting with the content, we found that actually that different types work better on different platforms. And, and just in terms of social media in general, so not just YouTube, but Facebook, Twitter, once you build up that audience that is subscribed or following you or has liked your page, it's such a concentrated base of users that really want that type of content that once a week content isn't good enough for them, they need that drip feeding of content, which obviously can be high production content all the time, but maybe it is behind the scenes or whatever it is, which we see works best. Um, but it's an amazing opportunity for the first time ever, particularly on YouTube, for clubs in particular to have that direct relationship with their audience. Um, AC Milan is a good channel where they produce a specific show called Hashtag The Future. They now uh, produce a show which is just about their academy, and it's about all the players can be up to their academy direct to their audience because it's such a direct relationship. I was just going to ask as well, in terms of, um, I know one thing that YouTube is very keen on, one thing I learned, you know, when I was a couple of for me, is in terms of collaborations. So, I mean, do you see the opportunity for clubs and organisations to kind of collaborate with YouTube as well and have that audience? Do you think that would be a possibility? Or do you think that's a kind of too far? In terms of, sorry, can you repeat again? Yeah, just in terms of, I mean, one of the best ways in terms of um, building an audience on YouTube especially is to collaborate with YouTubers because they're very native to the platform and they're bringing across a very large audience. But it hasn't seems, seems been something that we've seen that's kind of crossed over to sports clubs and federations and looked at that side. Do you think there's a potential there? Massive potential, the, one, it's one of the best techniques for gaining an audience on YouTube um, is actually collaborating with other channels and crossover of audiences. Um, outside of sports, you see Jamie Oliver has an original channel that launched as well um, just after Christmas. And Jamie Oliver, for instance, was not the celebrity with this generation on YouTube. Uh, in a channel called uh, Food, uh, is it it's Food. I forget the exact name, but it's a food um, channel on YouTube that has a big followership. And basically, Jamie is coming to them to be introduced to their audience, to share the audience with Jamie. And I think if you think about traditional broadcasting and everything else, it, it's a case of protecting your audience and not opening it up to lose it to anywhere else. But on YouTube, it's much more about sharing that audience um, rather than protecting it. So it's one of the best ways to promote uh, your content on YouTube. One thing is, I think the platform is it will get better over time at actually um, letting people know that an event will happen for a channel or promoting um, a YouTube channel, which is something that product design needs to get better at in promoting things on YouTube. Like Comedy Week this week on YouTube, so we're having a lot of, I think it's 100 YouTube channels in total, actually creating specific content for YouTube and then sharing audiences to try and get the benefit of all the audience. Is that something you think that it's could work at some time in BT if you wanted to kind of make that cross over to YouTube and use YouTubers or would really it very much be within kind of BT content? No, very much so. Uh, that's exactly where we're going to be. Uh, I mean, um, I'll, I'll take a fifth a little bit on that because we do have some specific plans around you know, working with YouTube and Google uh, in particular, uh, <coughs> in particular. 
Um, but you know, in its broadest sense, we need to be where our audiences are, or our potential audiences are. And uh, that means looking right across uh, all of the social media platforms that are available to us, then that's exactly where we should be. Um, I'm very interested in the fact that um, the Daily Mail, for example, are now starting uh, Google Hangouts every Friday afternoon. Uh, and that, that actually feels quite significant to me because that's telling me that there is a, a movement towards Google Plus and, and Hangouts. And I think that, um, in, again, in a broad sense, that they could become a um, place where we want to be uh, and be seen. So, we'll see how that goes. Um, just for a quick look, though, as I realise I've got enough Wi Fi to actually use TweetDeck again. Um, one from Tom Scott, who um, said so we've asked, we talked a lot about pre recorded content, but have been an opportunity to buy a video and play Google Hangouts, so if it's a quite nice and good. How big an opportunity is live video? Live video. Oh, well, it's crucial. I mean, especially in terms of, of sporting events, um, hence, just talking about BT Sport, hence the, 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 the drive towards acquiring rights to be able to show live sporting events. And it's where audiences are, it's where they want to be, and uh, it's absolutely front and centre of, of what we want to do. Um, it is an interesting point, but I mean, it's probably the most uh, common question I've been asked about is what will we do? in digital terms for BT Sport. And we do have specific plans, um, but, uh, but as a general principle, we will work around where we have acquired live rights. It makes sense to do that. Um, I firmly anticipate questions that will be around, are we taking on Sky, are we taking on the BBC? So I'll sort of preempt that by saying, yes, we are in the sense that we're moving into the same marketplace, no, we're not in terms of breadth or depth of content. It goes to read, stands to reason. You can see the difference between what Sky has and what we have. Sky has been in this game for 20 plus years. We haven't actually yet entered the marketplace. So we'll do what we do, and we'll focus our efforts around the line we right. Um, I think it was very interesting three weeks ago or so. That I got, I got, I got, it sounds like a male reader, but actually, as we all know, the Mail Online has a huge readership, and you know, to, to be mentioned on the Mail Online is that actually you're reaching a lot of people. It was very, very significant, we think, that the second paragraph of a story that they did in which they wrapped up our announcement of Gareth Bale, Van Persie, and Alex Osley Chamberlain as ambassadors. To date, to that point, BT was normally described as the telecoms giant. That was the first time we were described as the broadcaster. We haven't broadcast a second yet. That was a very significant, but, but, but almost imperceptible move, which we think was, a, was big. What would we done in the marketplace up to that point as a broadcaster? Discuss. Um, but it tells you something, I think, about the way that the, the perception of BT and BT's, with the arrival of BT Sport, is changing. Um, the challenge there was actually to go out there and be a broadcast. Uh, we're, we're going to do that. Thank you, Dennis. In terms of, obviously, the live content from YouTube, I, mean, I think the Scottus event last year proved that you know, 8 million people can come and brought to the broadcast. I mean, where do you see that going kind of back? Um, I think it's, yeah, it's a trend that's continuing with the Olympics. We live streamed all events as well on a geo basis um, around the world in different geos, uh, block geos based on rights. Um, but I think it's only going to get bigger and bigger. I think if you look at the audience, we have a billion people on YouTube, but the audience that's most active on the platform is definitely this Generation C, we say, so they're below the age of 35, very connected, very uh, spend an awful lot of time on the platform. And in terms of that audience, they, they, if, you, if you look at some of that audience actually which is very big in terms of gaming, and you think of computer gaming and that audience and how they actually look at computer gamers competing, which is a professional sport now, a lot of it actually happens on YouTube, uh, live streaming, but other platforms as well in terms of live streaming. And you have gamers who are trading and getting 200,000 people viewing that content at once. So this generation really enjoys live content and I think as they get older they'll expect it more and more and the ease of 
of access of that live content. Um, so there's definitely a demand from the audience side, but of course it will take time um, for the right models to be in place for uh, rights holders to actually stream that live content. Yeah, and I think, I think the interesting area at the moment is, is the, the little bit of space between these two guys, where there's a, there, there's a rights package that has a, has a rights only you're selling to a Sky Sport or a BT Sport, which kind of has quite a bit of stuff dumped in with it. So uh, the RFU rights will be sold to, to Sky Sports, and as part of that package there will be kind of championship rights and age grade games and all that sort of thing, which historically haven't had a great deal of value for the broadcaster, we're now getting into a situation where they've got a lot more value for the rights owner because you can start to uh, start to stream those live. You can use them as you know, fan engagement pieces or uh, pieces of content to um, to co-brand with partners and so add value to sponsorships or you put it behind a you know, pound of view paper or something like that. So there's there's an interesting little flux going on at the moment where. I think the next round of, um, of rights negotiations for all rights holders, uh, the, the governing body end of that, are going to be much sharper on what they do with those little, little games, the, the kind of the lower lower level games that have been locked in up until now. Well, we've been, well, I've been talking quite a bit for the last couple of half an hour, so is there any questions from the audience that you can think of that you want to find this way? Tom? Um, I'm just wondering, with uh, with kind of increasing levels of dual screening, do, do you feel that there's that opportunity with video in dual screening? Because the amount of time there's conversation around a certain video or bit of content on TV, is the opportunity there for dual screening with video at the same time? This is quite relevant as well in terms of the recent deals on Twitter done with the SPN and the NBA as well. We kind of do the snippets of live content. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a big opportunity there with it. Um, I think a good example is the All the Six Nations YouTube channel where they're doing in-game highlights. So for instance, when a try was scored or a conversion just kicked, you could actually look at that replay straight away. So catch up replays in games. Um, I think yeah, I think there's a big opportunity for it, and it's a term that it's a case of as well. We think of dual screening. Uh, people say second screening sometimes, talking about mobile device or tablet. We definitely think that sometimes it's actually uh, the primary device is the mobile device or tablet device and that you might want to throw that content up to your TV or whatever it is and um, that's the content that's closest to your, to your actual face at the time. Um, but I think it's just going to get bigger and bigger but I think as I said earlier in terms of uh, device agnostic so it'll be very easy to actually put content um, on whatever uh, screen is there but as well in terms of TV Soon enough, connected TVs will be so mainstream. The fact that you will be able to look at the stats for a player or whatever it is you want to look at on your big TV screen, um, I think, in the future. Yeah, uh, I think, I think, yes, it's the simple answer. The second screen, the screen, it is absolutely critical. But I think the key is providing the viewer, the user, with something that they're not getting from the, the main channel. And that's the trick is doing something that isn't just gimmicky. It's not there just because, mm, what can we do because somebody else has a screen, somebody has another screen in their hand. What's something that's of value to the user? Now, again, um, actually it's the second time we've mentioned what GP, but it's fresh in my mind. When I was behind the scenes in, in the production facilities in the uh, mall at the weekend, I was seeing things that aren't being used uh, in, in public outputs that I really love to get my hands on and it's really around the telemetry that's coming back from the bikes on the track and it's fascinating stuff um, for, for me anyway and I suspect for a large part of the audience. But that kind of thing tells me if I could get my hands on that and inject that into a set of screen, I know that that would be an absolute hit for the audience. There are sensitivities around it and there are issues that have to be overcome. But this is, this is where I think that, that the, the rights holders themselves have a big role to play in breaking that ground with interested parties and clearing the way for us to do different things and to help sports innovate through the use of second screens or some other devices. Okay, is any other questions or sorts of advice that anyone's after while we've got of esteemed experts up here? No, I'll pick off Twitter. Oh, God. 
Okay, so, so uh, Richard Biggles is talking about a lot of um, sort of citizen filmmaking and discovering young talent that isn't coming out of the traditional channels. What's the challenges and what's the opportunities for brands and rights holders uh, with that sort of latent audience out there that's getting cheaper and cheaper equipment and they're going to be experimenting all over the place? Well, I think obviously there are opportunities. Um, I think that you have to be careful in not, in not raising an expectation and then not fulfilling it. Um, we saw this so many times in the BBC where content would be submitted to us and frankly there was too much of it and nowhere, nowhere to put it. So you have to be very careful and focused and not simply throw open the doors to anybody to go off and do something. And then what exactly do you do with it? And we were looking at something this afternoon that was um, pulling in content through the use of hashtags perhaps some advancements in the use of hashtags would enable that content to be pulled in with minimal resource into a one overall repository if you like uh, and that may be a way of, of helping to address that raising of an expectation which can't then be fulfilled. Um, I think it also needs, you also need a very clear definition of what you want from an audience. I mean, is it simply something that is, that is audience feedback or is it something that is, I'm going to go back to the, 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 the phrase again of storytelling. Do you want the audience to tell you a story or do you want them to tell you what they think about something? And you need to be very clear and very careful about, uh, about what, that, what the parameters are that you're asking for. Um, just on the Richard COVID-19 comment as well, like for instance COVID-19 are looking for their next presenter for going to Rio for the World Cup next year and they're actually asking for submissions through YouTube. So two of those videos have had roughly 20,000 views to date. They've received over 80 applications. It's a great opportunity to actually reach the masses on YouTube or whatever social media network it is and to get people uh, basically doing interviews for you or trialing for you. Um, even further than that, people are discovered on YouTube all the time, uh, Justin Bieber, um, but now as well we've seen that move into the other uh, categories of sports. Um, about five weeks ago, the Detroit Lions signed a new kicker um, for the NFL in Norwegian player for a YouTube video, I don't know if you've ever seen it called Kickalicious, uh, where a Norwegian footballer was kicking like crazy uh, long 50 meter um, kicks over like a, a, a goal. And um, basically they trialled them as a result of that. So there's a great opportunity out there right now for professional contracts to find this talent. Um, you can even see that right now, Simon Cowell with his company Cycle. They've just launched a recent channel called New, Gen uh, uh, New Generation, or the U Generation, um, where they actually ask for submissions for competitions to find the next presenter. In the same way, you'd, outreach, you'd reach out to bloggers or you'd reach out to your, to your brand advocates or your brand heroes. You know? If there's someone out there who's, who's creating fantastic content about what you're doing, I don't, I, I don't think you need to kind of own that content. You know? it's, it's about facilitating things for that person so that they can create more content and better content and you know, feed into it in the ways that you can so that you can extract something from it. But I don't, I don't see that it needs anything sort of... Uh, more heavy-handed or more sophisticated than that, to be honest. Supplementary, please, Dan. Vine, question mark. <laughs> yes, exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> you sure it's answer, I <laughs> Well, given that Lewis Wiltshire practically lives on Twitter, I have to say that what a wonderful thing it is. Um, I'm not sure yet, actually. I think I've seen some very good ones, and I've seen ones, and I've actually done a couple myself, and they've been a bit shit, actually. You know, you know, what was the point in that? That's six seconds of my life, I'm not getting back. Um, I don't know. I, I think as a concept, it's, 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 it has value to it. I'm just not sure yet that its applications have been... We haven't seen the extent to which it can be used. Um, I have seen some very good football ones. I do like in particular the ones where you might have a sequence of people and they end up saying words, they say words which end up forming a sentence and, and that can be quite effective. But um, yeah, it is, it is vine discuss. With, with or the vine, I don't know, it's, um, we'll see. Yeah. It's going to be an interesting one. I'd like to try to qualify my guess a little bit. I think, um, <laughs> But where I see the value in it is, is uh, 
in the way it integrates with Twitter and in the way that you can uh, deliver a piece of video content directly into Twitter within a matter of seconds, literally. So um, from a sort of a, a, a team point of view, you can grab six seconds of, of guys walking into the tunnel and have it out there where you can, you can have the six seconds at half time of someone getting stitched up by the team doctor, that kind of thing. And it's just, it's that immediacy and, uh, and, and providing the content in a really sort of vital way that, that attracts me about it. I think, I think the two best uses I've seen of it from, from my own good feet is um, I think stop motion, the ability to do that, it, you know, that leads to a lot of creativity. I think the ATP did a really nice one where they showed a quick snippet and just headshot of every single player that was in the tournament. It looked really nice, it was kind of just a nice way to look at it. And I think another one was from David Gilbert from the FA, when he was sat behind the dugout at the FA Cup final and happened to record the Wigan bench jumping up and down, going completely mental for six seconds. And that one, I think, had 1,500, 2,000 retweets from his own account. And then, obviously, retweeted it from the FA one, so it was a nice experiment from their point of view, but it caught emotion, and it got it out there really, really quickly. And it was something that broadcast showed a little bit of, but it actually came more kind of depth to it. So it kind of proved, it added value to the broadcast, and added value to Twitter. I think that's one of the best uses of it. But it's really hard to try and catch that moment. And especially if you can't catch live content at that moment either, you can catch a reaction to the live content. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, people showing a 360 shot around an empty stadium or something, it has very, very limited value. Uh, any other questions? I will read one that's, where's the guys from Rural Net? Over there. They asked one which is all about advertising. So how will advertising change with the video including live versus traditional TV advertising? Is the opportunity for that yet? Oh sorry, thanks. Um, yeah, first of all I think you're seeing that uh, in terms of traditional adverts for TV, very much um, very second adverts, get your message out there, this is who we are, that's the traditional TV sense in terms of branding. In terms of how we would see the best use of um, branded content, so basically advertisers become more publishers now rather than just creating actual adverts. Um, there's some great examples, I think the best example probably there is in terms of um, Nike, where they have to date uh, started a competition called The Chance, um, started three years ago, where they uh, trialed 75,000 footballers who between the ages of 15 to 18 and basically created a, an online series all around that. Uh, where they uh, selected eight of the best uh, of those people who were never discovered by professional football clubs and they didn't have the contract. Uh, then they became part of the Nike Academy and over that full year they had trials um, against other big clubs, international and those clubs. Check it out on YouTube. And um, basically those eight players from 2010 are all professional uh, football athletes now. Uh, Tom Rogic is the most famous one playing for Celtic in Australia. And this content is just amazing. It's a uh, branded content, it's non-traditional advertising, um, it's just amazing. And uh, BWIN as well is another example of this where they're creating good uh, content as well, which they think will not only be paid, but a lot of earned money as well. So it's being shared a lot um, through whatever social network it is, but being passed around. So it's not just only looking at paid media to earn, but as well building up your audience and doing your audience more and more. And in terms of life, there's a massive opportunity there now to act quickly for brands, uh, which they're not usually used to. So actually reacting very quickly to what's actually happening out there in the world. A great example of that was during um, the American Super Bowl this year, where Oreo uh, tweeted, um, Oreo without lights out, or something like this, a picture, which was retweeted thousands and thousands of times. So it was really just playing on live events and what was actually happening. So I think what you're going to see more and more of um, is live adverts, or almost real time. Uh, even with YouTube, uh, we had an announcement last week at Google I.O. where anyone over a thousand subscribers can now uh, live stream through a YouTube account. So I think uh, brands will start to get clever about that and release content more and more on a live basis as well. Cool.
Is any other last question out there? Or should we wrap up? Okay, what we'll do, I'll just ask one question for each. So each of you to answer. In terms of video and kind of digital, what do you think is going to be the next thing that we're going to be looking out for the next couple of years to get? Uh, I, I think there's, going back to the second screening idea, I, I've, uh, predictions in the future always, always come bite you in the arse, but um, I've got a feeling that the second screening is a little bit of a mini disc in that actually um, the answer eventually is going to be uh, integrating that, that sort of social stream and that additional data into your primary screen and having the control over, over how that sits and where. So, um, uh, I think that there are going to be some things that, around that that's going to bubble up. Um, I would say that definitely echo that comment as well, but in terms of interactive video, two-way conversations and the opportunities there. Um, so even thinking about uh, earlier where we were saying about finding talent and actually if you have five presenters for a show, actually testing them on YouTube and seeing what the users are already are saying in real time, looking at uh, users if they're actually dropping off at a certain time, so it's an audience retention report in YouTube if any of you have accounts. So really using the benefits of that, but as well interactive videos, so clicking to other sites within videos or uh, interactions in there. And lastly, I think it's really with YouTube specifically, having that direct uh, social relationship with your audience. We've changed the platform an awful lot more over the, uh, a lot over the last seven to eight months where it's much more about that social experience and engaging with your audience and the power of actually having that relationship directly with your audience for distributing video content I think is amazing and it's just going to increase more and more over time. Um, I don't know the answer to that and that's the truth. Um, but what I suspect will happen is that filtering tools around social will become more sophisticated and will enable the user to deliver accompanying contextual content uh, in a more granular way. And I think that if you can get narrow things right down to either a specific place or even, even more focused down on a specific field of interest, then match that up with the video. I think you're then moving towards a much more attractive proposition. But frankly, when that will happen, well, it is happening. But, but I'm not sure if there's an end game to that. I do think that's an evolution of existing uh, filters. Uh, and there are many companies in the market that's doing it. Uh, but I think that's quite an important uh, thing that it's, it's perhaps even almost uh, subconscious that, that people just see it happening and they, they just want to do more of it. So I think that if developers and social media platforms are able to catch that uh, desire and develop that further, and just, albeit subtly, I mean I remember that one of the things that Twitter did not that long ago was enabled you to get down to tweets from a certain city. And I know you can go further than that by using other filtering tools, but I don't know yet that that's actually really caught on and is used in the mainstream. Um, or at least not at a very high level. And I think that maybe that's the way that things will go.